We see a revival in her soul take place. Ruth brought it home. She came to face the soul that was broken. And she said, I've got some barley. I've got some harvest. I'm going to bring it to this broken soul. And I'm going to see God do his revival. Ruth recognized it. She recognized the power that was in her hand through this grain. And she knew that it can change Amara into a Naomi. So today we're going to be learning about the harvest. We're going to be learning about, in specific, to the barley harvest. And this harvest is extremely important because it shows us two things. Number one, how we as bundles of barley participate in overcoming battles in this world and in the heavenlies. But it also shows us the responsible, the responsibility that we as these barleys, as these bundles of barleys have to winning souls. So I want you to pocket that in the back of your head as we dive deep into this revelation. So in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 1, the Israelites are instructed by the priests to bring the priest a sheaf of the first grain of the harvest. That's what they've been instructed to do. And you can read this in Leviticus chapter 23 and you read onwards. Israelites are instructed to bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain, the harvest. And the grain that's being referred to here is barley. And the reason why it's barley is because this grain is actually the first to mature. And this maturity of barley is referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, as an application to Jesus Christ himself. So you might be wondering, what does this all mean? How are we going to tie these pieces together? And before we go into that, I want to kind of share a little bit of facts about barley for those of you who don't know. So barley actually is the first grain to ever mature. And barley is actually planted in December and it's harvested at. So because it's um, plowed out and it's planted in December, this time becomes staple food for all peoples, especially poor people. And barley, because it's planted in December, it can handle many weather conditions. It can handle harsh winters. It can handle cold. It can handle brutal to very gentle trickles of rain. It can handle hail. Barley can withstand many, many crucial weather conditions. And my most favorite is that when barley is finally matured and the sun is shining ever so brightly on a field of barley, it looks white as snow. And this is referenced to by Jesus Christ in John chapter 4, verses 35. And that's really significant, and I want you to also keep that in mind. So barley is extremely important in the vicinity of Bethlehem because small plots of barley were planted all over this town. And it was plowed by by hand. It was plowed by the poor peasant people. And this process is actually described in the book of Ruth. And I hope some people's gears are turning because that might be familiar to you if you've read the book of Ruth and you can see that significance already running through your head. And the most important part about barley is the threshing process, when you're actually taking the barley and pulling it out of its field. And this threshing process is extremely important. And this is when I want you to really turn your ears into listening, because this explanation will draw a parallel to the gospel. This explanation draws a parallel to what happens in your life and in the life of other people. And there's several things in this process that I want to talk about. So number one, peasant women, like Ruth at the time, they cut at the grain, and then they tie it into bundles, and they leave it to dry. Then comes the threshing part, and this is when that dry barley is now taken apart and is threshed apart, and it's pulled by a sledge, typically it was by an animal, it was by a donkey, and now it was pulled away from the field and its bundles to be separated from the rest of the field, or was to be separated from the other crops that didn't serve the same useful and unique purpose that barley was going to serve. So it had to be cut, it had to be grouped together, and then it had to be set apart. Does that make sense to everybody? 
And this is very important, and I want you to understand that. So barley now is the most referenced to grain in the entire Bible. If you scan through many moments, especially in 1 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, the book of Ruth, the book of Judges, and John, and Revelations, and the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, barley is referenced to many times because it signifies maturity. It also signifies and prefigures multiplication. And we see this in two examples. We see the multiplication of barley in the life of Elisha. When the man had brought him barley grain and barley bread, and Elisha had ordered this man to now give that and supply it to the many poor that was surrounding that town at the time. We also see barley and its act of multiplication when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. The boy brought the loaves of barley bread. So barley prefigures multiplication. Now barley also signifies the overcomer, and this is extremely interesting. You see the ripening of barley actually follows Passover, and you and I know that Passover signifies the death of Jesus Christ. And following that is the ripening of this barley, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the offering of the first fruits. And you can read this in 1 Corinthians where it talks about Jesus being the first fruit. So we see here this thematic cycle of the Passover, and now comes the offering of the first fruits. We go from death to life, from old to new. And barley represents this theme of overcoming, of becoming new. And if the barley sheaf was not ripe, then the people would not be allowed lawfully to recognize the Passover. So unless the barley was eared out, unless it was ripe, Unless it was finally set apart, then only does it signify this newness. And we see that in the life of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So barley is extremely important as a spiritual significance to the life and to that, that newness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in a barley field, you experience this process of newness. You experience going from old to new, from green to white. It's a beautiful process. But at the same time, you experience and you encounter cleaning. You experience the removal of certain things. You experience being cut and being threshed through. And this process that takes place sometimes in a barley field may not always be so pretty. It may not always be so easy. Because remember, you're planted in December. Barley is planted through the harsh, harsh weather conditions, through the brutal cold, through the harsh snow, through the hail, through the ice. It's put through a lot of conditions. And these weather conditions actually symbolize and they draw a depiction of Satan and his powers that can occur in this world. So those who remain planted in that field, those who are not moved by any weather condition, those who don't let a little bit of cold make themselves want to shrivel and run away, those who endure to the end, they get a reward. And we can see this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to um, 13, if you want to turn with me. Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to 13. And it says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted. You're cut and you're plowed at. And you put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. It's a harsh weather condition, isn't that? When we're hated and we're persecuted and we're neglected and all that kind of stuff that comes in when we stand for God. It's harsh. That's a weather condition. And it says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. You'll shiver. It gets cold. There's not enough layers, not enough mittens, not enough hats that protect us from that cold, piercing hatred that we receive from people in these last days. 
but I love this. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The one who stays in the field and allows God to keep plowing and harvesting in those conditions, they will be saved. And then it says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. You're in that field and God works on you. And he plows at you and he prepares you despite all those weather conditions. But you're saved. You pass the threshold and you are now in bundles. And you are set apart for your unique purpose, your unique call for the world. And through that, you have been given the task to preach the gospel, to be a testimony, to be a witness to what had happened in that field. So it's very important that you, as someone who's planted and rooted in that harvest, understand the process and the aftermath that takes place when you are plowed out of that field. So to the person who remains in the field, to the person who remains until they are fully ripe, you now graduate to a new level that is equal to of Jesus Christ, the first fruit. The one who will now take you as he ascends into heaven in his second coming. And we can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 to 23. And it says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, those who have stayed and remained in the field until fully ripe and set apart, when our first fruit comes back, your graduation occurs and you ascend into heaven with him. That is the reward for sticking through in the field. But that's just the beginning of it. I know that's the most incredible part, but in between that moment where we ascend with the first fruit, there's so much that takes place when you are part of that barley harvest. And the great news is that we are harvested while still in the flesh, while still in the husk of the grain, right? That's why in Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when we began our journey and our walk with God, don't forget that you were once a sinner, that you were once hidden in the darkness. You were once pursuing to gratify the desires of the flesh. But the reaper didn't give up on you. The reaper found you and he planted you in that field and he knows you're a sinner. He knows you're so green, but he plows and he plows and he cleans and he cleans and he cuts and he puts you side he bundles you up together with other like-minded people and he sets you apart until you are white as snow and that is why understanding that ripe experience that we have in the field is more useful than we ever think the reaper is God the reaper is his salvation first he puts the sickle to us and he now creates a process where we are separated from our earthly sources of nourishment. We don't seek for those things that satisfy our flesh anymore. It's a deeper process. We want his word. We want time in his presence. We want his anointing. And those are the nourishments that slowly start to change our color from green to white. He then establishes the church inside of us. He finds the like-minded individuals and he causes us to stand upright instead of on our own and weak. A barley cannot stand on its own. The grain is not strong enough. Barley is grouped together. The reaper brings us together and he ties us up because he knows that a stalk of barley cannot stand upright on its own. So he ties us together to run that race that he has set for us to do, to be the last day's church, to be the Philadelphia church, that in our little strength, we can lean completely on him and we can thrive until the first fruit comes. So when we are brought to the threshing floor, this is now when we as the church, we as the Christian are now really truly established in this world because there's so many other things in this field. There's so many other crops, but God now groups us together and he threshes us and we are now plowed and we are taken separate away from the other crops.
and he separates us so that we are protected from thieves that may come and steal from that field. But he also separates us that we can go out and be useful for what barley is useful for. It's useful for multiplication. It's useful for remembrance because once the barley is ripe, we can acknowledge Passover and celebrate resurrection. It's also made to be woven into priestly garments. Did you know that? The hem of the garment is made out of barley flax seeds. It's interesting, there are so many uses for barley, and that applies to you and me. So now this process, now that I think the, the picture is clear, the picture is clear of what takes place in the field, what took place in our soul, and if you are wise enough, you can understand the parallel of this process in the field to what salvation does for our soul. This being in the field, the process of barley being harvested in that field is our exposure to salvation, it's our acceptance of salvation, and it's the effects of salvation in our life once we receive Jesus Christ and we move on to be ambassadors of him. So when you think about this parallel, when you think about this narrative, it's great, isn't it? It's beautiful. Remember that 180 complete transformation on your soul, that second you gave your life to Jesus and nothing else was the same? When you had an eternal hope place in you, an advocate to be by your side every second of the day, the fruits of the spirit, the anointing, the ability to communicate with God in a heavenly language, it's a beautiful process, isn't it? Remember that. The ripening of your life, of your soul, was fantastic. But here's what it is. We can't keep what takes place in the harvest a secret. That is not ours to keep, it's ours to share. Once we overcome those harsh weathers and we are successfully beyond the threshold, it's our responsibility now to go and tell the world and there are people in the Bible who recognize that, and I'm going to talk about them in a brief moment. But I think most people in this day and age who grew up in an urban, a suburban environment, they have no idea the importance that the barley harvest has to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I really want you to open up your spiritual ears and stick with this biblical metaphor with me for a second. You see, we celebrate, we commemorate, we always remember Easter, Christmas, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, all of it. We remember it, we celebrate it. Some people only come to church on those days. People buy many special outfits for those days. I'm one of those. I love dressing up on these special days. But the reason why Jesus was born the reason why he was sent, the reason why he died, the reason why he rose again was so that he could harvest the people of this world. It was more than just a tick in your calendar. It was to harvest this world. It was to be so much so that if we were to look out into the fields, it would all be white as snow. That's what Jesus said and that's what Jesus wants to see. That's why the first fruit is representative of this complete harvest. And you and I, as bundles of barley, are responsible for harvesting. That means if he, the first fruit, will come soon, then I am placed rightfully in this harvest. Somewhere in the middle, I am placed in this harvest. Maybe today you're placing yourself for the very first time in the harvest. Maybe today you're being taken out of the threshold. Maybe today you're a strong, connected bundle of barley to the church. Maybe today is the day that you are white as snow. Maybe today is your harvest. But I know for sure that beyond this threshold, that I, that you, that we, Everyone watching, we play an important role in this harvest. Somewhere in the middle of it, you and I play a massive role in seeing the fields white as snow. We have to be honest with that and we have to recognize that. That you and I play a role, the harvest is near, the harvest has come, and it's not over yet. Until Jesus returns, until the first fruit has come to take us up with him, the harvest is still going on. 
Toronto Harvest Missionary Church. The harvest is now. That's something that I want you to write down and keep in your soul on the tip of your tongue. The harvest is now. And many people, many, many, many people, some certain situations come up and they have a long stock of reasons as to why they're not expecting a white field. And you read about it, they read about it, they read about the past experiences of harvests and revivals, and they look forward in hope that maybe one day history will repeat itself. But until then, we read over and over again in John chapter 4 that Jesus meets the Samaritan woman and he's warning her, he's prefiguring certain times to be ready for. He says, behold, the hour has come where the Father is looking for worshipers of spirit and truth. Then he says to the disciples, behold, look up. The fields are white as snow. The time has come where the fields are white as snow. But many people, like the saying that Jesus says, they say, oh, we have four more months. And he's frustrated. I'm tired of hearing that people are saying there's four months left, there's four months more to go, four months. No, behold, look up, the fields are white as snow, is what Jesus says. And he says, harvest. It is time to harvest. Jesus says everything for a reason. He makes no mistakes. Whatever is written in here cannot be argued with, and it has intent. So he's saying this for a reason. He's speaking this today for a reason. Because behold, the hour has come. But in response, many people say, there's still time. Four months more. The fields can wait. There's still some more time for me to go and harvest a soul. I'll just wait till I'm done my test. I'll wait till I'm done this shift. I'll wait till I'm out of this place. I'll wait till I'm done this assignment. I'll wait until he's done his food. I'll wait until my children are married. I'll wait until I get this job. I'll wait until I land and I nail this interview. I'll wait until I'm done this phone call. I'll wait until she's having a better day. I'll wait until I retire. I'll wait until they quit smoking. I'll wait until she quits drinking. I'll wait until they come back next month. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. I genuinely did not realize that we serve a God who plays a waiting game. That's false. Behold, look up, the fields are white as snow. The harvest is ripe. Every day, there's someone to harvest, even in your own home. As I'm speaking this, I know there's someone who's popping up in your head, that person. That person who you know is lost, that person who you know is doomed for eternity because they don't know Jesus. That person that's popping up right now in your head as I speak. The harvest is now for you to speak the name of Jesus into their life and to give them that hope, to give them that love, to bound them in the cords that you are so opportunitive to have and to be a part of. We don't keep that a secret that is not to be kept with us. But sometimes we're just so used to waiting on these body-oriented signals for us to say, okay, now is the time. I'm not saying, like we had discussed last week, getting the job, finishing school, being a stellar student, that is absolutely incredibly important. I'm not undermining that. But we have to remember that we are souls, that our souls are important. We are not bodies. We know that this decays. This tent is perishing. If you don't believe me, buy a mirror, go home, look hard into it, and see if what's staring back at you is what was staring at you two months ago. You don't look the same. You don't, but that soul, the soul you're thinking about today, what's happening to that? Place yourself in the harvest and bring those in with you. Behold, the fields are white as snow. That's why in Mark chapter eight, verses 36 and 37, I love this that Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. It's the truth. When we sit there and we wait until we think the month is ready, we're denying and we're, we're ashamed. You deny that ripening process that happened in your life. And one day when the first fruit is now coming down, he'll be ashamed in the presence of the Father's glory. I don't think any of us here who love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, and mind ever want to be ashamed by God. That's just not what we're called and destined to be. We as bundles of barley are being called to be concerned over people's soul. So don't neglect it and don't keep it a secret. And an example of this can be seen in the life of Gideon and in Ruth. Now, Judges chapter 6 and 7 are extremely important must-read chapters of the Bible for you who are the newly called or for you who, who is ripe. These two chapters of the Bible are extremely important and they're very interesting. In chapter 6, Gideon, the farmer, has just been tapped by God as the mighty man of valor. And this man of valor, this mighty man, is the one who's going to save Israel at this point. And interesting enough, I see an incredible parallel to the life of Ruth, similar to that of the process that takes place in the barley harvest. Ruth was once a foreigner. She was once just like us, an alien, a foreigner, someone new, someone lost that's just been placed in the field green as ever. That was what Ruth's condition was. But Ruth, she stuck in the field like us. She planted herself in there and she kept harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. And then she becomes cultivated in this harvest. And then she claims God as her God. She takes what seemed like once an impossible character. And now she makes it into a reality. Because God takes the old and he takes the broken and he brings out a new mighty character. That is when we are made white like snow. So this character, Ruth, she gives herself in the field. She gives herself completely to God. She's infamous for her lines where she looks at Naomi and she says, where you go, I go. Your God is my God. From that moment, she committed herself to the job, to the task, the assignment, to the role, to the character, to the call, to the kingdom of God. That second of the confession. So Ruth finds herself now making a living in this barley field. She's specifically placed in a barley field. Isn't that interesting? I don't know how many of you have noticed that. Or maybe you've read past it, but it's a barley field that she was placed in. And now she's harvesting. And now this rich and this well-known and this incredible man named Boaz, he comes and he recognizes this woman, this noble character, and he says, I've seen all that you've done. I've seen you withstand the harsh and brutal weather conditions. I've seen you take up this new character. When you were once alone and you felt like an alien and you were persecuted and you were empty, I've seen it. And you remained in the field and you harvested. And in that moment, I realized that you left your homeland, you left all that you were, and you followed and pursued your mother-in-law to live with people that you had no idea about. And now Ruth at that moment is commemorated for being a noble woman. Everyone in the town is seeing her as something so different from anything else that has come in that town before. And to be called a noble woman at that time was very, very rare. A noble woman is actually the term chayel in Hebrew. And that term is not just thrown around to anyone. Ruth was the only one given the name chayel, a woman of valor. Besides Gideon, she's the only woman given that title. That's how rare it was. So this woman of valor, a mighty, worthy person, who's taking the great courage to go out into battle and take on an assignment that she knows she can't do on her own. She accomplishes it. 
She plants herself in the harvest, and she keeps going, and she keeps going, and she keeps plowing, and she keeps doing what she knows that she's called to do. She accomplishes that task, and she's given the title, you are a mighty woman of valor. So incredible, so inspiring. So both Ruth and Gideon are now referred to as a people of valor, a people who are brave, a people who keep praying, a people who keep harvesting, a noble character that is rare. Only rare people can get through those persecutions. Only people that recognize the task that's in front of them that is of grave importance to the Father in heaven who set it apart before them. And Ruth and Gideon recognize that. That's why I look up to them. And I hope you do too. And at this time now, when Gideon is being tapped by God and he's given this assignment, his view of God was so limited. And he was so, in that moment, discouraged and he keeps calling himself weak, he keeps calling himself the lesser than, he's not acknowledging in that moment the power that God is gonna give him. When he starts off, he starts off weak and timid. But then God promises to be with him. He assures him that he's gonna win Israel's victory. And Gideon, now becoming brave like Ruth, takes his stance and he takes on this new assignment. And now the Spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon and God graciously answers his test of the fleece and Gideon now goes early and he brings up all his men with him and they head straight to battle. Then God begins to overturn the natural practicality and do the supernatural. And I love this part. I want you to go home and really read Judges chapter 6 and 7 and study this battle. It's so victorious and there's so many secrets that I truly believe God wants to whisper into your ears. But for those of you who don't know, Gideon now begins out with 22,000 men around him. And God is saying, we got to cut it down. Because if there's so many people, they're going to just say, we won because of our own strength. Because we're so high and mighty in power, we did it ourselves. But we know God. And we know that we serve a God who deserves all glory. It's not for self-glory. It's not self-righteousness. But it's the power and the spirit of God. So God recognizes this. And he says, before they can even open their mouth and defile what I'm about to do for them, i got to cut them down. So it goes from 22,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 300. And the Bible says that God winnowed it down. For those of you who don't know the term winnow, it means to blow a current of air through grain in order to remove the chaff. So he promises to give them and take them and help them extremely win this victory. But he had to cut. He had to put them through the threshold. He had to separate and find the useful. That's you sitting here. You are the useful. We go through so many cuts, many moments of things that we think are taken away from us because they're losses. But no, God is a strategist. God knows where to place you with who to place so that you can win battles and gain victory for the name of Jesus. So God had to winnow these men from 22,000 to 300. Then he ties up this bundle of barley, this bundle of men, this army that goes out past the dust, winnowed from the grain, set apart from this field, divided, removed, gotten rid of all the excess fluff. And now they're ready to charge forth because they're suitable, because they're ripe, because they're ready, because they're filled and clothed with the spirit of God. And they go out into the battlefield. And what happens? The Midianites are destroyed. Not only do they just get destroyed like that, but the Midianites themselves look at each other and they start slashing one another. That's a godly victory. The enemies don't just fall, but they become so confused and so delusional that they start going at it again each other. Can you imagine getting those 300 men? They didn't have to do anything. They're ready. They're armed. They give themselves to God. And before they can even draw their sword, the enemies just did the job for them. Yes. 
that's a God victory. And that's what happens when you allow God to do his winnowing process. He puts us together. Those of us who are bound by the cords of his love and his power and his anointing, he brings us together to go and overcome Midianites, to go and overcome Babylonic walls of these last days, to go out and to win that harvest for the kingdom of God. You and I have been winnowed down and we are that army. Isn't that incredible, church? I love that revelation. And Ruth, she's someone who understood it the same way. And she did not keep it a secret. She was tired. She was exhausted. But she's gleaning away the barley. And she is harvesting and harvesting and harvesting. Now, I want to give you a little background now. So Naomi, her mother-in-law, she's not as strong as Ruth is. She actually starts to call herself Mara. And Mara means the one who has been disregarded by the Almighty God. She changed her own name. Naomi's discouraged. How many of you know a discouraged person? How many of you right now can think about a lost person? How many of you can think about a sick person? How many of you can think about someone who's drowning in sin right now? Yeah, there's a lot of Maras in our life, aren't there? And Ruth recognized that. There was a Mara in her life. So she's tired, but she goes as a happy gleaner, and she returns to her home that evening. And Ruth, on that first day, is now proven by God Almighty, by Jehovah Jireh, that this poor stranger who decides to trust in the God of Israel has now satisfied her, has now provided. So Ruth right now experiencing the fullness, experiencing the ripening in that harvest, she's like, I can't keep this a secret. I can't keep this a secret. I've got a discouraged. I've got an empty. I've got an alone feeling person in my home. I got to go bring this harvest towards them. So Ruth makes her way. She comes back into the city. And she shows her mother-in-law what she gleaned. And she brings it forward. And she shares that harvest with Naomi. And now Naomi, who now is calling herself Mara, she looks at this. And now she's in awe. The unexpected and undeniable supernatural providing hand of God is now looking at her. And then she says, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. But today, I know he is dealing oh so graciously. The love of God was lifting the veil of this unbelieving, complaining Mara. And she now begins to reference herself as Naomi. We see a revival in her soul take place. Ruth brought it home. She came to face the soul that was broken. And she said, I've got some barley. I've got some harvest. I'm going to bring it to this broken soul. And I'm going to see God do his revival. Bible, Ruth recognized it. She recognized the power that was in her hand through this grain. And she knew that it can change Amara into a Naomi.